Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into tonight's second half, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost you a cent. Click the like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump into tonight's second half, shall we? All right, guys, so I did go through all of the subscriber submitted emails today. I had over 102 just emails from subscribers from November until uh, today <laughs> that I had starred to contact, uh, either contact via phone, email, or print out their experiences. Um, as I'm going through the emails, I receive new ones. Uh, just like everyone else, I get the, you know, emails that should be spam but are not for some reason. And then, you know, I get the, the, the emails that matter to me, the ones from you guys. Um, and I got almost 15 emails today in regards to today's first upload. Um, the National Park maintenance worker and the reptilian uh, men in black asking about the experience I was talking about in that video about the uh, men in black threatening Boy Scouts and asking where they could find it. And I said, well, you know what? There is so many emails. Let's use that as today's second half video because it is an amazing, terrifying experience full of information. Um, and it fits into everything that we are talking about lately. These, these men in black, these reptilian men in black working for Homeland Security go hand in hand with Dulce underground military bases, goes hand in hand with, you know, and I said Dulce because there's, that is probably one of the best known deep underground military bases, but there are many of them. Uh, Groom Lake, um, you know, I got an email from a subscriber the other day and they said, hey, uh, what do you think about a deep underground military base being directly under Yellowstone? And I was like, well, probably not because the total amount of land mass under the state park or national park itself is a volcanic caldera. Um, unless these alien agenda, you know, unless these creatures are fireproof, I'd say maybe in the surroundings. Um, but the more I look at these deep underground military bases, they do not line up with state parks or national parks. They kind of just fall on the outreaches of them. Uh, so, these men in black 
are now going hand in hand with deep underground military base uh, information. And now with a corrupt government and cryptids. It is all connected. All of it. And I've been saying that since I started my channel that I believe everything that has a supernatural, a unexplainable uh, title or whatnot is connected to, they are all connected. I really believe that there is a deep underground military base under or around where Skinwalker Ranch would be. That would explain a hell of a lot of the uh, high strangeness that goes on there as well. Um, this is the experience that was spoken about in today's first half. Reptilian men in black working for Department of Homeland Security threatening Boy Scouts of America, not just the, not just the, uh, organization, but an actual life scout trying to get his eagle. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today's upload takes place in an area called Dent Township, Missouri, which is located kind of smack dab right in the middle of Mark Twain National Forest. Um, talked to this gentleman at about 11 o'clock Sunday evening and then at about 10 um, Monday night, pieced everything together with him so we could, or so I could share this with you guys. Uh, pretty horrifying experience this young man and a couple of his friends went through back in 2008. Um, as many of you may know, um, some may not, but Boy Scouts, when you're in the Boy Scouts, uh, to receive your Eagle Scout, you have to do kind of a um, public project, something to... Uh, show your ability and initiative to not only work to better yourself, but to better the community. And <clears throat> this is exactly what this young man and a couple of his friends were doing uh, the day he experienced his encounter with what he believes and I do believe was a dog man. So let's get into it. So 2008, a uh, gentleman named Josh and three of his friends and little brother and his little brother's friend all piled into um, Josh's Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee, an older one. It was his granddad's given to him, 19, like 90 beater, and um, they headed out to an area in Dent Township called Sam Crocker Cemetery. That was where um, Josh and his Boy Scout friends were going to do his community um, project. They were going to clean up the cemetery, uh, refresh some of the stones, dig around the stones that were in the ground to kind of raise them up a little bit. Uh, where the grass had kind of grown over some of them. Now, <clears throat> his little brother and one of his friends, his little brother's friend, went along. They were going to go and fish at this little creek called uh, Cordius Creek. And it's a nice, beautiful Saturday, summer day. Um, they head out at around 11 a.m., they planned on staying there for about five or six hours. Of course, you know, they had brought in some lunch and stuff like that. These these kids are Boy Scouts. Um, they, you know, I joked with them because 
When I was a scout, me and my friends <laughs> were not the upstanding scouts that the uh, back in the day Boy Scouts betrayed. We smoked ciggies and we used to bring flasks with us on camp trips. But, um, you know, I, I, I had to ask. I said, listen, you know, this is what we used to do. And no, no. I. He's like, I was going for my Eagle Scout. And I was like, well, I was a Life Scout until my, until my troop folded up. But... You know, I was going for my Eagle Scout too. And um <clears throat> but nonetheless, good kids, times were different, I guess. And um so they got to the cemetery. It was about eleven thirty, eleven forty five after they had dropped his brother off. Um there was three friends of Josh's and his little brother and his friend. So there was six in total um in this old jeep that he had and um they they got cleaning around and doing their things um at around 1 30 uh two park rangers because like i said it sat smack dab in the middle of mark twain national forest came in um checking on them, making sure everything was okay, if they needed anything. And they, you know, said, no, we're good. Um, the ranger said, you know, if you need anything, we're going to be in this area. We'll come back around and check. Um, there's a highway or a route called Route Z or Highway Z that leads up into 80 in the, these rangers were going to go <clears throat> up to a hollow just above uh, where Sam Crocker Cemetery is. Um, roughly almost around where they dropped uh, Josh's little brother off. He said, my little brother's up there fishing. You don't mind checking in on him. Um, just making sure he's okay. Let him know. You know, that I'll come up in about two hours and grab him or see if he needs anything when we take a break for lunch. Yeah, sure, kid. So they continue to do their their thing. Um, they're cleaning their cemeteries out or cleaning the cemetery. Uh, really doing a lot of raking and stuff. Um, one of the friends was mending uh, part of a fence and he had kind of seen something off in the distance because there's kind of a clearing just opposite of the uh, cemetery. There, there's a rather large clearing and then forest. And um, he had seen what he thought was a bear because during that period of time, there had been a couple of bear sightings. Uh, a couple of people had taken some pictures of some bear and he ran over to Josh and said, Hey, I think I just saw a bear and it kind of looked like it was heading um, up towards where Highway Z and 80 meet, kind of like where your brother is. And Josh is like, all right, you know, let's take a ride up. You know, we've been here for a couple of hours now. Let's go grab my brother. We'll bring him down. We'll have some lunch and then he can go to the other end of the creek. Um, kind of south of, of them. And uh, so that's what they did. They drove up. No issues. Picked the boys up. Josh said, hey, did you see the, the park rangers or whatnot? No, nope, didn't see anybody, you know. Josh thought that was, that was kind of weird, you know, that, because he's known these park rangers, um, he's done work with them and, uh, these park rangers have come and worked with their troop and stuff like that. So these boys aren't strangers to these, you know, this area at all, or the, the park rangers that work in the national forest there. So they pick up the brother, they get back to the cemetery and there's kind of like a a little 
not pavilion, but kind of sort of a pavilion, um, like a roofed off open sided little area. And they kind of sat there and had their lunch. Now the kid who had seen the, what he thought was a bear, um, had his water jacket left it by the fence there where he was working. And as he was walking from point A to B, he got kind of like in the middle of the cemetery and there's, there's trees in this cemetery. I mean, obviously it's in a national forest, so there's going to be trees. He smells this really foul smell. Um, almost like rotten eggs with like a strong stench of um, animal feces and urine. And <clears throat> he's walking and he kind of stops and looks around, doesn't see anything, continues to walk and grabs his water jacket. Now the whole way he could smell the smell, but as he got closer to the fence, the smell kind of, uh, got less potent. So as he's walking back to where Josh and his friends are sitting, um, he's coming through and he, and the, the smell starts to get stronger, starts to get stronger. And he's like, what is that stink? That wasn't here. When we were here earlier, we only went to get Josh's little brother, yada, yada. So he goes back and he says, guys, there's a really foul stink. Like, and, uh, Josh is like kind of put off by it. Cause he, this is his project, you know, his Eagle Scout community project. This is, this is going to put him from life scout to Eagle Scout. And, um, He's at when he the kid describes the stench, he not does he think it's a, an animal, but he thinks that maybe someone dug up a grave and there's a body, you know, a decomposing body. So he gets up and he starts to walk and he's looking around the cemetery. <clears throat> Everyone else is sitting there, they're all having their lunch. Um and he's kind of walking and he smells it. He catches it. And he's like, wow, that's really strong. But he keeps, you know, walking and he gets over to where the jacket kid, where the kid left his water jacket. And like his friend said, it got less as I got closer to this area. And then when I got here, it started. And he kind of did like, uh, he kind of went in each direction, north, east, south. <clears throat> well, he had just come from the southern part of the, the thing. So he went north, east. And um, so he's looking and it's more pungent <clears throat> towards the, there's a highway on the opposite side of the cemetery. So Sam, Crocker Cemetery sits kind of in between Highway Z and Highway 80. Um, <clears throat> and Highway 80, or it's, uh, it's still Highway 80, but at one point it's like 2460 or 666, 2466. So he kind of walks there and he's like, maybe someone hit an animal. So he walks and he kind of peers around. Um, hops the fence, looks nothing. There's nothing on the road. He looks down the road both ways, comes back into the cemetery and <clears throat> he sees his friends and brother and his friend. They're now standing. He's about half a football field away from where his friends are. They're standing. When he walked past them, they were all sitting. You know, it took him about seven, eight minutes, maybe 10 
to get out to look at the road back and then go back to where he was coming. And um, he's like, why is everyone standing up? You know, what is going on? And he can smell the smell is just much more stronger now. So he's watching his friends and he keeps walking and they're yelling something. He can just make it out like, hurry up, hurry up. And he has no idea what what they're doing. He's like, what are they doing? Like he, he at first thinks that, you know, everyone's done. His brother and his friend are being a jerk. Like they want to go more, you know, fishing a little more and this and that. And so he gets probably halfway now to where they are. And he sees them. They're looking at him and they're looking um, up towards some of the older headstones. And, um, he sees this kind of dark silhouette and it's in the wood line, kind of like standing there pacing back and forth. And he's like, oh my God, that's the bear. That's, that's the bear that my friend saw. So he's like, I can't run because if it sees me running, even though I'm not running away from it, it's going to come down at me because, you know, this thing's north of him and his friends are straight across from him. So it's right in between them. So if he runs, he's thinking it's going to either get me or get them. So he's like, I'm just going to walk. I'm going to keep my eye on this thing. And get to where my friends and my car is parked. And we'll just, you know, get in the car and wait it out, honk the horn, scare it, whatever. And um, so he starts walking. And as he's walking, he's keeping an eye on this thing. And it's going, you know, it's not going back and forth in a long pathway. It's... It's more or less staying in between these kind of two larger trees with the backdrop of trees behind them. And as he gets probably 20 feet from 20, 30 feet from his friends to where they are, he kind of says, get to the car. He yells, get to the car. And he sees quite clearly that this thing is bipedal. And by then, he's like, that's not a bear. What? What is that? Um, he sees that it's like a, a dark brownish black color. And he can't make out much more than that, except that it's, you know, it's got ears that are sticking up off of its head. Obviously, it hasn't, you know gotten close to him so he can't really get a lot of detail he's he's getting what he can as he yells the thing stops it's pacing turns to face him and drops to all fours and starts running through the the cemetery through the stones and stuff the old headstones now he's takes off running gets to their car, everyone piles in the car, um, or the older Jeep. It's not like a Jeep Jeep, it's an older Jeep Grand Caravan, just this old kind of wooden paneled door. Just It was just a beater that his granddad had, and he bought it off his grandfather for a couple hundred bucks. Um, <clears throat> so everyone's in. His kid brother's in the back with his friend, and there he starts the, the Jeep up, and to get out of the cemetery, the road 80 is closer, but you can't get out that way from where they are. There's no exit. They've got to go out through this kind of road that's 
it's a road, but it's not really a road. It's not a marked road. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a wooded road. And then it cuts into a field and then um, heads kind of north up onto 80. Because once you get out into the opening, there's a good, a good length of, of this road that's surrounded by trees. And then you get to an opening and you've got to go kind of straight up to get to 80. So even though it would be faster if there was a road right there, but the creek is there. This Cordius Creek is right there. So they can't go that way. So as they're going down this wooded road, um, his little brother is, is crying and screaming like, what is that? Oh my God. You know, what is that? Um, it's catching us. It's catching us. And <clears throat> he's, you know, shut up. Just let me drive, you know, and as they're coming around this kind of corner. This There's some rocks and some trees in the area. And he really has to kind of slow down. Um, you know, there's some old pine trees. Uh, old cut logs and stuff. And so he kind of like slows down. And as he's slowing, he's looking in his rear view. And he's, he just sees this. It, he said it, it looked like a black, jet black, um, German Shepherd, like face. It was the size of a smaller pony. And he said it had these just stoplight red eyes. Um, as he gets up around this he's probably a mile from the entrance to 80 and he kind of forks it and he doesn't see in his rear view this creature that's chasing him his brother's crying his brother's real young you know 11 maybe 12 the friends are all screaming like what the hell was that oh my god and as he's can now see the entrance of 80. He sees this creature kind of cut across the field. And it's looks like it's going to collide head on with their Jeep. And he's like, if I have to hit this thing, I'm going to hit it. I, you know, that's just how it's going to be. As they get Closer to each other, he said he saw this thing, and it was in, he, Jeff, it was in slow motion. He said it jumped. It was in full stride. He said, and as it was in stride, he said it jumped. And it was slow motion. It just leapt. And when it landed, it landed on the hood of my Jeep. It was like... Bam, right on the hood. Um, he slams on his brakes. The thing falls off the Jeep and gets up and stands up in front of the Jeep. He's now, him, his friend who are in the front seat, his friends that are the two friends that are in the back, and his brother and his friend that are in the back back are all now kind of looking at this creature that is now standing face to face with them and jeep's still running there's nothing wrong with the jeep he's just stopped out of shock like i just hit this an i just hit this animal but it was the animal's fault it jumped on my car you know um so josh can see exactly what this thing looks like he said it's, it wasn't that much taller than I was. He said at the time I was maybe 5'10". He said so maybe 6 foot. He said maybe this thing was 6 foot. 
He said it looked like it weighed 200 pounds. Um, all this like jet black brown colored kind of mixed in together. Uh, head to toe. There was no white. There was no kind of any other coloration other than this jet black dark brown color intermixed. He's looking, they're looking at each other. Everyone's looking at this thing. And its eyes are, like he said, it stop light red and just glow, not glowing, but glowing. Um, you could clearly see. He's like, how in his head, he's thinking, how is this thing's eyes that color? In the daytime, my lights aren't on. You know, he, he's trying to process. He's trying to process something that our brain is not meant to process. Uh, something that we are told we are not ever, you know, supposed to know of. So, plus he's 16 years old. Going to be 17. And, um, the thing kind of, he's sitting there, got his foot on the brake, and he sees the Cree. His friends are yelling, go, 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 you know. He's in his head, do I hit this thing? What if I hit it and it hurt, you know, ruins the Jeep? What if I hit it and it goes under the Jeep and hurt, you know, ruins the bottom of the Jeep and we're stuck here? Or if I hit it and it goes through the front windshield? Um, you know, cause obviously he's, he, he's thinking about deer. People have hit deer and people have gotten seriously hurt from hitting a deer because they've gone through their front windshield and stuff like that. And, uh, he kind of gives it a little gas and honks the horn to get it thinking maybe it'll go away. You know, I don't know what I'm seeing. I, you know, he, he's been a, he was a Cub Scout, we blow Boy Scout, um, and dedicated, like super dedicated to being an Eagle Scout. Like that was his whole goal. He's like, I was, I was one of those kids that, you know, I was kind of popular in high school, but I wasn't really popular because I, I, I did play baseball. But everyone knew I was a Boy Scout, you know, and so it was just, and he's like, what the hell? It, the thing snarls. He can't hear anything because his friends are screaming. The Jeep's running, but he sees its lips curl. And he said it was almost like the thing smiled at him. Like, it knew that I didn't know what to do and it was happy with the situation that we were in and it kind of did this smile at me. Um, he said at that point he honks again and takes his foot off the brake and gives it some gas and the creature doesn't move he drives up a little bit and stops again. So they're now closer to each other. And he's like, I, I'm kind of stuck at this point, Jeff. I'm kind of like, I don't want to hit it. I can't go, you know, I can't from the distance I am from this creature. If I do give it gas, I'm not going to kill it. I'm not going to hurt it. It's more or less probably a better chance that it hurts me and my friends and my brothers, you know, my brother and his friend. So he goes, I made the only other decision that I could. He said, I put it in reverse and I punched it backwards. He said his friends are now in a panic because they're going backwards instead of forward toward the road. But the creature stares at him and it, it 
it's just staring at them. And he said that that smile, that look that it had left its face. He said, and it was dropping to all fours at that point. He said, I jammed it into drive and punched it. He said there was, you know, dirt kicked up. And as I punched it, he said, I gave myself enough room to get a little bit of speed. You know, I wasn't going 30 miles an hour. He goes, I was going about 15. But I was going to, you know, I was ready to collide into this thing. He said, as I started going towards it, it hit it all fours and kind of jumped towards the driver's side of where the Jeep would be. Didn't go over the Jeep, but just just barely, they just missed each other. <clears throat> and he's now punching it towards the entrance to 80. Um, his brother lets out this terrible and just very, like, frightening scream and uh he's like it's on the back of the door it's on the back of the door and it was holding on to the back bumper and the rack of the jeep it had gotten behind him and was trying to climb up onto the jeep they hit 80 and um, there's a kind of a, a lump going out onto 80. And uh, as they go out that way, they're coming up to where 80 kind of forks. There's farmland on one side. You can see Highway Z and they're going to go. He's hoping that this thing just gets off. The vehicle. Well, they get onto the the road and it doesn't. It's still kind of holding on. Um, he kind of veers out onto the highway, and as he's veering out, he sees the park ranger's truck coming towards them. So, the ranger's truck. He can see the ranger's truck coming down Z. This Highway Z, he's still on 80. He's got a turn. Now, the way to his house is back the other way. On like, So think of you're going north. And it, it's a very easy turn to continue to go north on Z. But where his house, where to get back to his home, you would almost have to go south. And that's a more of a, you know... deeper angle to turn so he's honking his horn he's flicking his lights at the ranger the ranger sees the truck and he doesn't see what the rangers are doing he just sees their truck coming towards them and he's like i don't know what to do at this time at this point because we're almost like head to head you know I stop. He goes, and when I stop, he said, this thing jumps off the back of my Jeep. He said, and I punched it and went past the park ranger and got onto Highway Z. And he said, I continued to drive for 10 minutes at least. Well, then they realize, hey, we've got to turn around. You know, we haven't seen this thing. It's not following us. We got to turn around and get go that way back home. They don't want to because they don't want to run into this thing again. So they do. They end up going up probably two, three miles and then turning around. And um, as they are coming towards where they had just pulled out. Um, they see the Rangers truck there. Uh, both Rangers are out of the truck. 
and they're looking at something and Josh kind of stops and, you know, he's like, well, what the heck happened? You know, maybe they, they got the bear or whatever this thing was. Um, cause in his head at that point, he was like, part of me thought it was still like this, just maybe rabid bear. I don't know. It looked and ran like a dog, but it was big like a bear. Um, not bulky like, you know, a bear would be, like a six foot tall bear. But that's the only other thing he could think of. Uh, they pull up and the park ranger that was standing on the passenger side um, comes walking up to Josh's window and says, you know, it's probably best you boys get out of here now. Um, you know, we just, we just put down this animal, you know, we've got our bosses are coming in to take care of this. Uh, we're not going to say that you were here or anything, just go. And, um, they can, they said, all right, thank you, you know, Josh, but the, all the kids are like, you know, what was it? What was that thing? What was that thing? And they're driving down and, uh, they get to, they're driving probably, you know, four or five miles and they see three park ranger trucks flying up, uh, the road and, a trooper car um, behind them. The police officer kind of, they pass, the, the ranger trucks go right up. Police officer kind of spins around, does a Yui and pulls Josh and the boys over. Um, at that point, Josh kind of just says, yeah, we were, you know, up at Sam Crocker and this bear or dog or whatever it was, um, tried attacking us. And the trooper looked at the boys and said, you know, it, it, that it was just a dog guys. It was just, you know, don't worry about it. Go about your business. And, uh, you know, he took everybody's name, address, and stuff like that, and just go. Um, they're all talking about it, you know, for a couple of days. They're just like, what What do you think that thing was? The little brother's like, that was a werewolf. Did you see it? It was walking, you know, on its, like a human. It was, you know, it had a muzzle. They're confused. They don't, you know. About six, seven days go by and uh, Josh goes to meet up with his scout leader. And um, his scout master called him up and said, hey, you know, Josh, great job on, you know, everything at the uh, cemetery. I heard there was a little bit of, you know, come up to the house. I, I'd like to talk to you about everything and, uh, let's get this, you know, let's get, let's get this straightened out get, you know, get you to where you can get your Eagle Scout badge. And, um, you know, you, you, you did the work, but let's get it, you know, figured out. So he's like, yeah, yeah, sure. He gets to the house and, um, he sees, a park ranger vehicle and a black kind of suburban like vehicle in his scoutmaster's yard. Now he knows that his scoutmaster does not own a black suburban. Uh, you know, wealth isn't something that was too big back then, you know, where he lived. You know, his scoutmaster had this old beat-up truck that he drove around, 
and his wife had a beat up car, you know, they, they just good people and lived, lived hard, you know, lived paycheck by paycheck. So he knew they couldn't afford this brand new suburban that was in their driveway. So Josh pulls in and, um, knocks at the door. His scout master says, Hey bud, you know, come on in this, this and that. And he said, you know, what's going on? You know, um, is this about the other day? You know, he says, just come on in and, you know, let's, uh, let's talk about your Eagle Scout badge and your community service hours that you have to, you know, there's an X amount of hours and stuff that you have to achieve to get your bat, your Eagle Scout. So he, he's like, all right. And he's very kind of like hesitant, but he, you know, he's known his scout master for years. So he trusts him and they go into his kitchen. Um, the park ranger is sitting at the kitchen table and there's a female in like a pantsuit and two other males in suits. Um, one of the guy has glasses. The other guy is just, you know, about six, one, six, two. Uh, he said he really didn't look like he belonged in a suit. You know, he was just a bigger guy. He said he just didn't look, the suit just didn't suit him, if you know what I mean. And, um, so when they get in, he's told, not asked, told to sit down. Um, the scoutmaster's home has these kind of like, uh, benches at their kitchen table. So it's kind of like a rustic kind of kitchen table and he sits down at the bench. Um, the park ranger sitting in front of him. The scout master sits next to the park ranger. The female sits next to, uh, the, the park ranger on the other side. And these two men sit right beside Josh on either side of him. And, um, the park ranger says, Hey Josh, you know, how are you? Are you guys okay? Uh, was there any damage to your Jeep that needs to be taken care of? You know, any scratches, any kind of, you know, hair, was there anything there? You know, any kind of debris from this animal that you seen at the, the park that day or the, cemetery that day and he's like no 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 I just you know what's going on am I getting you know he's like he thinks he's going to be arrested and he was brought there under kind of false pretense so he's kind of looking at his scout master like you know help me help me um at that point the female gets up and goes outside and with like this clipboard kind of thing. The two guy, the two men in these suits are sitting there and the smaller of the two, the one in glasses, um, kind of pats him in, on his back and says, you know, I, I, I was an Eagle Scout myself. It's, it is a wonderful achievement, you know? And, um, the other guy, says, you know, you're going to be an Eagle Scout. There's no more that you have to do. There's nothing more that you have to do. You've met, you've met your required everything. And, and, and Josh knows in his head that he's still got, you know, hours and certain, he didn't fully do what his community project was meant you know, was supposed to be because there's a guide thing that you lay out and, um, <clears throat> it's handed to the scout master and scout master then hands it to the council and stuff like that. And it goes up the line and, uh, the larger guy who didn't belong in the suit just says, you know, we're, 
we're here now to make sure that you get your Eagle Scout badge right now. Um, thing of the matter is, is you have one last thing to do. And he's now scared because he's like, well, kind of what? what? You know, where'd this lady go? And now I'm stuck between you two and my scoutmaster, who I trust, is across the table. And a park ranger, who I'm fa fairly familiar with, is, uh, you know, and the scoutmaster has this kind of like a large envelope and slides it. And the uh, gentleman in glasses says, open that up. And sure enough, it's his Eagle Scout and all the paperwork that goes with it and everything like that, the certificate and stuff. <clears throat> and um, the larger guy in the suit says, we're giving you this today because we know that you are trustworthy and you cannot tell anyone what occurred that day at the cemetery. And you have to let your friends know exactly what happened. Um, that, you know, you guys saw a bear and you guys got spooked and left. Um, you never saw it run bipedally, you never saw it stand bipedally, and you didn't see that these park rangers had put it down. Um, that's all you need to know, and you need to tell your friends the same thing we're telling you. Otherwise, we'll, we will come back, we will come, we, instead of having you come here, we will come to your home. We will come to your home. We will take your Eagle Scout. We will also take you and bring you with us and your friends, your brother, his friend. And they named them. They, they named every person that was in that Jeep. Josh is thinking, how the hell does, you know, he know everybody that was in the Jeep and he's thinking it and thinking it and you know a couple months go by and he puts it together that that state trooper had asked them for all of their information who's in who, what's your name what's your of course everyone's going to say it they're good kids they're boy scouts and they're, you know, they just had some traumatic inc incident happen. Um, you know, it, they're not going to give any kind of false information. They're shitting their pants. Pardon the French. Um, I always want to say that part in the French. It's so stupid. Um, Josh says, I understand a hundred percent. I understand. And, uh, they, they talk a couple more minutes, nothing really too major. Gets his packet, his envelope there and starts to, you know, he says, can, can I please go, go home now? You know, am I okay? And, um, the one larger guy said, yeah, you can, you can go home. Yep. Just remember what, what, what the conversation was here. You don't want to see us at your house, nor does your friends, your family, and their family. This conversation won't be what it is today. And as this guy's saying this to Josh, he's looking at his scoutmaster, like, who are these people? What did you, you know? And his scoutmaster just it puts his head down and can't look at him at all. Um, he goes back and tells everybody what 
they can and can't say and this and that. Uh, shortly thereafter, his scout master um, and his wife moved out of the location, out of the area, and um, he had never seen him again. He had tried to look for him on social media and everything, just to kind of clarify a few things, and has never been able to find him. Um, thinks that, you know, in his heart of hearts, thinks that he was forced to move because he knew what went on. And, uh, he's like, I think they moved my scoutmaster. So in case I ever said something, there was nobody there to deny or validate what I was saying. Uh, and that was his, that was his experience, you know, it's crazy because then he goes you know jeff i have hear about these creatures that are seven eight feet tall and that wasn't the case he said this thing was much smaller like like he said you know he's like i was only a couple of inches taller than me if that and um years went by and he asked his little brother about, you know, that day. And, um, his little brother said it looked like a demon, like a demon dog, a hellhound was chasing us when I was in the back. He said, I looked out that back window and he goes, all I could see was this monstrous jet black dog with red eyes chasing this jeep he said i was afraid it was going to come through the back windshield and you know take me and my friend and uh yeah so <laughs> incredible experience I, I can't imagine having something like that happen you know you and um he, you know, he, he had plans to do more with the scouts and stuff like that. And kind of just, it petered off. It was something that he didn't ever want to do. His little brother was a, uh, was a wee blow. And, um, Josh kind of convinced him to stay out of the wee blows, tell his mom and dad that he didn't want to, you know, partake in anything anymore, uh, with the boy scouts. And, um, yeah, so it was just crazy, real messed him up because he's held on to this thing for years, but we talked and he thinks, and I think that what he ran into was, you know, a young dog man, maybe not fully grown. Um, he said, I just don't know where it was when we were smelling it. Was it in the trees watching us? Did it follow us? Like when we went to get my little brother and you know, this and that, like what, what happened? And it's all been just this kind of something that's weighed heavily on his shoulders for years. So he, uh, reached out and wanted to share. All right, guys, that is the experience I talked about while I was sharing the national parks maintenance workers experience men in black reptilian um you know it, it makes sense it makes sense if you think about all of the talk about these men in black these black and white pictures of the men in black you know why wouldn't they be reptilian why would they be human because they look human is that is that pretty much the same Along the same lines as what Nick Van Drimini says in his book, Them and Us, the only reason why Neanderthal is depicted as human-like with a loincloth and whatnot is because we want it to look like us. It makes more sense to me than 
uh, these men in black not to be human, but to appear as being human. A product of the one world government alliance with the alien agenda. <clears throat> and, and, and if that is true, if that theory is true, then, you know, that means that these monsters, human, alien, whatever, uh, have control and knowledge of everything. And we are just sheep to them. Guys, I hope you enjoyed tonight's second half as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I appreciate all of the support. Your support is what continues to make the channel grow and go. And honestly, what makes it so special, a place for people to share uh, without judgment and without ridicule. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, our pets, our family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there. They're dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions. Never stop searching for the truth. God bless.